Hey guys, this week we are talking about Josh's trip to Aria, if we need to change the name of our show, listener questions and more, so stick around. This episode sponsored by Fiverr. Looking to turn your next big idea into a reality? Visit crapvegas.com slash F-I-V-E-R-R today to learn more. Welcome to the Crap Vegas Podcast. Vegas, here we come. Vegas! Here are your hosts, Chris and Josh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 63 of the Crap Vegas Podcast. I am Chris. He's Josh. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. We have a new kitten in our household, and she is uh, keeping everybody up nights, and kittens are really cute, but I had forgotten how kind of high maintenance they are. No, I got lucky when I adopted my cats, they were already a year old, both of them. So they were both, you know, trained and all that good stuff and taking care of themselves. And yeah, they were pretty hands off. Yeah, she's a lot of fun. I told this story on the uh, the last CVP show, but I'll tell you guys too. So we, she's a rescue kitten and this woman that kind of good Samaritan cat person goes around and rescues rescue kittens and finds homes for them and all that kind of thing. And I had to meet up with this lady at 11 o'clock at night in a library parking lot in this little town near us. It was a little scary for a kitten transfer. not shady at all, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so she that's what's... She got the kitten trade done, and then she had a little mess sale on the <laughs> exactly. side. A little no, drug deal going what's on. What's going on? Yeah. So that's what's going on in our household. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Of course, school ramped up, so it's just been crazy busy. Yeah, same here. The only thing I can say that's been fun recently is I've been trying to desperately figure out some dates to get out to Vegas, but we'll talk about that a little later in the episode. Perfect. Okay, Josh, with that being said, let's tell people how to get a hold of us. You can send us an email. That is podcast at crapvegas.com. You can join us over on our Facebook group for a nice discussion. That's crapvegas.com slash Facebook. You can leave us a voicemail. That's crapvegas.com slash voicemail. Or the easiest way is always going to be on Twitter. X. He's at Vegas Duffy. I'm at Small Whale 13. Or the show page is at Crap Vegas. I feel always like a, just a little puppy waiting for my time to say X. Like just sitting there in. wagging my, my tail. I get to waiting. do something. I'm so helpful. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Previous episode feedback. We received a DM from listener Nicole. Nicole said, hey guys. Thank you so much for your last trip report from Vegas. I have been on the fence about trying Venetian, and I think you may have pushed me over the edge. That being said, a couple questions from your recent trip I was hoping you could clarify. You ready, Josh? Yes. Okay, one. My younger kids will be with me on my next trip, and your review of Buddy V's was promising. Would you say it's good for a family to eat there, and do you need to make reservations well in advance? Thanks so much for the question, Nicole. First of all, Buddy V's is fantastic for kids. I think Chris agrees. It, it's a great spot to take a family, I would think. And as for reservations, because Chris screwed up and getting the reservation for us on our last trip, he thought it was booked and it turned out, was it the, the different weekend, Chris? What was it that you had booked? No, we just, we just hadn't done anything we just at hadn't all. Done we hadn't it booked at all. anything. So no, we, actually, we logged on at what, one o'clock? And right. there was plenty of reservations for that night. Right. And that was the weekend, right? Yeah, it was a Friday night, I think, or Saturday. It was a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. So we were able to get right in. So I would say, I mean, maybe we were an exception, but it wasn't super hard to get in. And it's, it's really family friendly. I think the prices are pretty reasonable. It's a great option. Yeah. I think I refer to it as like a really upscale Olive Garden. Yep. It's catering to fam. We saw tons of families while we were there. Young kids, older kids, big groups. Yeah. You'd be perfectly fine. I mean, I never would discourage somebody from making a reservation a week in advance or so. Right. If you know the date you want to go just to make sure you're locked in, but no, there was plenty of walk-ups while we were there too. So I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. What's next? Question number two, Josh. We won't be renting a car. Is taxi service from Venetian fairly speedy? Yes. I think we took a cab a few places or I at least took a cab when I went from Venetian to Aria. No problems at all. Like all the big resorts, sometimes you can have a little wait, but they, at all the big places, they move pretty quickly in and out. They funnel people pretty easily. I wouldn't think that'd be any trouble. Yeah, I agree with Josh there. Last question. My husband's conference is being held at Resorts World. How long is the walk from Venetian to Resorts World? What do you think, Chris? Let's see. From Venetian to Wynn is probably seven, eight minutes. You've got to go to the other side. I yeah, would say I was going to put it in like 15, 12 to 15. Yeah. About a 12 to 15 minute walk. Yeah. It depends on how fast you walk. You do have to cross the street. I mean, you got a couple lights you're going to have to wait through, but 12 to 15 minutes is probably fair. Just 
just understand if you're making that walk later at night, it's not exactly the best area to be walking. It could be far worse. If you were up by Fountain Blue, it'd be far worse than that. But right. I mean, once you get past Win Encore, it's not the greatest area at night. No, it's not. And I would definitely say go to go from Venetian through Win Encore and then out yes. Encore, go that direction as opposed to yeah, taking, walking the whole strip. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. But thank you for your question, Nicole. We do appreciate it. We received an email from Thomas. Thomas said, congrats, Josh, on making Diamond and Venetian Palazzo. <laughs> wow, that's just what we need. Thanks, it's more Thomas. people making your head a little bit bigger than it was. My question is more general in nature, but I'm curious if you find that your offers got better from properties after advancing up their tiers. I recently hit gold with MGM and my offers haven't gone up at all. In fact, they have gone down. What's the point of hitting a new tier if you don't get better offers? Thanks for the show. You two are such a fun listen and I'm loving all the extra episodes on Patreon. Thanks, Thomas, for being a patron. Josh, does tier have anything to do with offers? It does not. It does have, you know, there is some value to tier. Some of it's just, I mean, for me, Venetian Diamond, I honestly don't know what I'm going to get out of Venetian Diamond that I wouldn't have been able to get anyway. Same with Platinum or Gold at MGM. Offers are dependent on your play for the most part, and they're not dependent on the tier level that you have. So if your play justifies higher or lower comps, that's probably what you'll get. Now, what your status does do is it can make your tier credits go up higher. Some statuses, you get a 30% slot boost and some it's 20 or things like that. And obviously dining credits that you might get at levels or spa credits or whatever else that might come along golf and things like that. But as far as your actual gambling offers, that's related almost entirely, I think, Chris, to your gambling level, your level of play, not your status. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, there's always been a misconception that your level has some sort of dictation of what kind of offers you're going to get. Like people, especially this happens a lot when people tier match, you'll see people go over to a new property and tier match into like their third highest tier right. and wonder why they're not getting offers because that tier match told them nothing about what kind of gambler you are. You'll see plenty of low level, like lowest tier level gamblers that are getting huge offers from a property because they only come once or twice a year and they just never have a chance to really get their status up, or maybe they're a table games player, so it's hard to develop through right. their program. And then you'll see people that are like Caesar seven star that have effectively no offer at all because what they're doing is grinding it out at their local property, you know, a hundred dollars a day coming yeah. every single day and earning no tier credit. So they have no ADT. You see both things. So no, your tier does not affect your offer at all. Usually that being said, like Josh said, there are some benefits to tiers, even small things like, at uh, hitting diamond level at Venetian Palazzo, it gives you a guaranteed late checkout of four o'clock. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, that's great. And that's right. not something that's just going to come to everybody. That's just a nice tier benefit. You don't even have to really push anybody or beg a host. You get it. Maybe transportation, something that you can earn through your tier that you wouldn't normally get. And like Josh said, those dining credits or spa credits, free rounds of golf, mm -hmm. all that stuff being stated offers are really nice. And you just don't have to bug somebody. And if you don't have a host, it's the only way you're going to get them. And something for me, I mean, that's, for instance, at Caesars that we didn't even mention, that's the obvious one is certain levels, certain properties, the way the automatic waiving of resort fees. Is, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm at the, I think it's diamond at Caesars, get my resort fees waived. And that's really all I expect on my, based on my level of play there. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys for your feedback this week and let's keep it moving. So Josh, last episode, we left off on our Sunday of our trip together, I was going home after all my flight fiascos. <laughs> but of course, you weren't going home. You were transferring over to Aria. Of course. And no, for those that ask, I didn't take, uh, you know, a rolls or anything over Aria because I was cheating on one property going to another. I forced myself to take a cab over to Aria. Do you feel guilty, Josh, when you're staying at one place to ask the second property to send a car for you? Yes, I do. I try not to ever even tell our hosts that obviously if any of them are listening to the show, they find out or anything like that. But I don't make it obvious. I don't know why I don't make it obvious that I'm going from one property to another. It just I'm just kind of feel I don't know. I feel guilty about it. You don't have you any know problem they with know, that. Right. Well, I, I know they at least know if they care to know. Yeah. I mean, they know because if you haven't told them, I probably told them. <laughs> And if, if I haven't told them, I know the dealers Chris know, is, and they talk. I mean, it's so, no, this is all not the tea. a secret. <laughs> yes. And, there, and we have a podcast. Spilled. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Believe me, last time I was at Wynn, I told them all about your disgust for their property right now. 
Hey, speaking of when we knew, we know we have a new dealer, not a new dealer, but a dealer that is new to listening to the show. So I won't name the name, but if you are listening, we're happy to have you listening. I miss you. There you go. I don't know about Chris, but. Well, I mean, I, Josh, I love everybody. You know me. I'm just you a do. loving person. I'm Mr. Happy. That's where everybody always calls me. That's my new nickname. That's, I know, Mr. Happy. <laughs> exactly. So tell me, Josh, you got over there. I assume you had a sky suite like always, because that's the only thing you'll stay in. How was the room? It was wonderful. Yes, I did have a sky suite. It was one of those penthouses on like the sixth floor. Sixth floor. It, yeah. yeah, it was, exactly. it was, it wasn't the sixth, but it wasn't nearly the top. It was like 27 or some, you know, some number like that. And sure. I think of you every time we get one of those, I had to wait only like yep. an hour or so, or maybe even less for my room this time, which was nice. And of course, because Chris had his fiasco with his flight home, which we talked about on episode 62, by the time I got over to Aria, Chris was still at Venetian. So oh, yeah. I think, yeah, you were kind of just getting ready finally to head to the airport. I snapped a quick picture of Posh Burger, which we should give a little update. You had speculated that, that Posh Burger was gone or going out. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay. hold on. Don't throw Chris under the bus. <laughs> Chris didn't speculate. <laughs> Reddit said that it was closed. And Josh, if you can't trust Reddit, where are we in this life? You're spreading Reddit rumors is what you are then. I mean, that's what this show has become now. I mean, hey, it could be worse. <laughs> there are people that do that for a living. So that's, it's that's okay. true. <laughs> anyway, ahead. Poshburger is still there. They have installed two new kiosks, two self-service, self-ordering kiosks where a person used to be. They're not bad the problem is a they they might be taking away a job which we're not in favor of but also they're a little clunky if there's trouble kind of the same thing with your self-service check-in kiosks as long as they work everything's great and they're perfect but sure. the minute something doesn't work then you have to get in line for a real person and that's usually double triple quadruple the time it used to be all that kind of thing so yeah. they worked fine for me except when they didn't and then i oh good yeah except when i and then i chose to go somewhere else so i did eat at posh burger a couple times the normal stuff. I like my fried chicken sandwich and mm -hmm. fries and that kind of thing. So it was good, you know, good casual fast food that I like. But anyway, before Chris even left, I decided I was going to play a little slots. Imagine and that. I, I know. That's going to be a recurring theme of this episode, by it, the way. It might be. Yeah, Chris, you can, you can push a little on that. But my new favorite slot machine is Huff and even more Puff, as Chris knows, because I made him play it a lot when we were playing slots together. No, Chris mm -hmm. never got the upgrade bonus. I got the upgrade bonus nope. a few times. I kept saying, Chris, just keep doing it. You'll hit it. He never hit it. Never hit it. Anyway, so I hit a big, huge jackpot before Chris was even on his plane. I sent him a picture of it. <laughs> he was like, you couldn't do that when we were pooling our money. I mean, it was a it was a consistent theme. Even if we were there at the same time, you would wait for me to not be pooling with you and then hit a jackpot and get a hand pay. And then when I leave, you start sending me thousands of pictures <laughs> of hand pay after hand pay and jump ahead to the end, Josh, just out of curiosity, how many W2Gs did you end up with? 37 on that, on that four day trip. That's normal. That's what the average <laughs> player gets when they're at a weekend, you know, especially a craps player. It may have been a little extreme. That kind of gives you an idea. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. kind of gives you an idea. I did play some, play some craps, uh, gambled until 10 o'clock that night, Chris, which as you know, for the two of us is super late. Yeah. yeah. That's like three o'clock in the morning, unless we're going to the clubs or something. I did have a little yeah. win on crapless. And then I proceeded to go play some more huff and even more puff and lost everything I had won on that big jackpot. And I think I even said, Josh, after you hit that one, I was like, Josh, that's awesome. Please don't give it all back. Right. You did. And I did give it all back, although we'll, we'll fast forward to the next day. I made some of that back. So did you hit the tier credit bonus like six times, I assume, because you earned millions of tier credits playing the slots like yeah, that? Yeah, I got the, the 40. So it was it, there, at, at MGM, if you hit 40,000 tier credits in a day, you get a 60,000 tier credit accelerator bonus. And I hit that both of the two days that I was there. So okay. I got 200 plus thousand tier credits just on that alone. And let's just keep in mind that you have already hit platinum for the year. So none of these tier credits really mean anything unless you think there's a chance you're going to hit Noir. The only way I could hit Noir is if I went back for one of these type trips again. And I don't see that happening this year. What, what is your current tier credit account, Josh? I'm about 800,000. Okay. And the, the general consensus among most people is that you need to be at 2 million. Well, no, I actually see a million from some people now. So I don't know. 
Okay. I've seen well, a million see. from our one of our one of our patrons and followers, Boondocks, I think, said somewhere in the million range. So and he's noir. But so I don't know for sure, but I don't think I'll get there. Okay. And we have actually talked about noir before as either being a goal that we had, but honestly, once we dug into it a little bit more, there just there isn't a lot of benefit for the tier. And maybe Boondocks can talk more about it and shoot us a message or something. But if you look at the details of Noir benefits beyond what you get at Platinum, it's extremely limited. Yeah. And that's part of the, I mean, yes, it would be fun to get it just like getting Diamond at Venetian is fun. But the way that Chris and I play, it's, it's really not that much different. Doesn't get I mean, us anything. Yeah, it doesn't get yeah. us anything we don't already get. So yes, it's fun. And I was happy to, you know, I'm happy to get the ones I get, but it's more of just a humble brag, no, I got you. not that a humble makes brag, sense. but whatever it is. So you wrap up Sunday, Josh, move on to Monday. You weren't going home till Tuesday. Any big things we should know from Monday? Well, so I played lots of crapless. I was really having a good time. Both Chris and I had had good luck at crapless, as you know, over at Palazzo. I played crapless. Chris, one point, I hit the 12 three times in a row. Not just three times on a roll, but three times in a row. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the parlay of the day right there. That makes you feel about as good as you can feel. Yeah. Unfortunately, of course, I hadn't parlayed, but I did have the last one, I think, at 500. Oh, okay. So, so a massive hit. Yeah. $3, yeah that, was a, that was a fantastic hit. So that was a great, a great nice. little run at Crapless. Then I did, as I said, I had sunk all of my big jackpot winnings back into Huff and even more Puff. I played a tiny little bit of video poker and a tiny little bit of other slot machines, but mostly it was Huff and even more Puff. And okay. I knew Chris had gone to bed and late at night on the, on whatever night it was, the second night I hit the huff and even more puff and got the upgrade bonus. And I won't go into huge slot talk for everybody. That's not slot people, but I got a whole bunch of mansions and mm -hmm. all of the upgrades green, except for like three or four squares were full of mansions. And I sent Chris just a picture of that screen that he then woke mm -hmm. up to the next day. You did. That was very nice of you. I appreciate that. <laughs> And you just want to rub my nose in a little bit. While yeah, you're that was kind of fun to do. Anyway, so I won, I won the biggest and we kind of teased it on the last show and I had to figure out how many figures it was. We decided what it was a five figure. Yes. It was five figures. It was a five. <laughs> Not was six. Was it five figure? I can't remember how much it was. It was 10. It was over 10. Oh yeah. Then yeah, five figures. That's five figures. So yes, that was the biggest jackpot, biggest slot jackpot that I've ever had. And no, it did not take me back above what I spent on slot machine. Now, Josh, did you consider with that many hand pays that you just mentioned, did you ever consider talking to a slot attendant about getting set up with that quick pay system that they all offer in their high limit rooms? No, but I really need to do that. It's more of just that I have, you know, this is kind of new to me, this level. So tell sure. people a little bit about what that means, Chris. So most places don't offer it on their main floor, but in their high limit rooms, most of these properties, when Venetian Palazzo, Aria, Bellagio, they offer, and they all call it different things, rapid pay, quick pay, right. fast pay. They offer a system where you can get with a slot attendant. They get all your information on file in advance, which in our case, it already is because we're credit players. But they get all that stuff imputed into their computer so that when you hit a hand pay on a machine, all it does is just flash up on the screen and ask you if you want to continue playing or if you want a slot, you know, a slot attendant to come over and hand right. pay it. So you have the ability to just download the win onto the machine. And then what they do is they typically pool all those W2Gs together and email it to you at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the trip, whatever it is. They just pool the data and send it to you in one fell swoop rather than having to sit there and wait what could be 5, 10, even 15 minutes to get paid. It's in their benefit to do so because it's mm -hmm. a lot easier for them. But more importantly, it keeps you playing. Because you're not waiting 10, 15 minutes to get paid. Right. You can continue playing immediately. So for them, they like it. And as a player, if you want to keep playing rapidly, it's a great system. It's also a huge con <laughs> as a player because it means you're playing more quickly. You're not, right. You don't have that downtime anymore. And so you could give back all your hand pay by the time it actually even came to you. Which I have done. And that's why I like it. So at Venetian they will give you the option of continuing to play while they're getting you your hand pay, or you can just wait mm -hmm. until you bring, they bring your hand pay at Aria. You just wait. So I kind of like that. At least I have to, for, it's a forced pause. I mean, they, now Josh, they will reset it if you ask them to. Oh, well, I, I you shouldn't have told I've me asked. that. Cause yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't so want they that. Will. I know I don't need that. 
But yeah, it was a lot yeah, of slots. Sure. I didn't play much slots. The next, the, the last day, I was only there for a couple hours in the morning on Sunday, whatever that was, on Tuesday morning, I guess it was. But I did want to say I met up with our friend and listener of the show and Star Trek celebrity, Garrett Wong, and mm-hmm. played with Garrett a little bit. And the one story I wanted to tell, told a little bit, talked a little bit more about that on our last CVP show. But one of the fun things about playing with Garrett is as we've talked about, and as he even talked about it, he's fairly superstitious. And we got to the end and I was going to do one last roll. And he had reached the point where he, you know, he was up. I think he was ready to go. And just his superstition side said, I should stop when I'm ready to be done. And what happens, Chris, I go on a fantastic roll and he's sitting there just watching the whole thing, which is why you and I can't just watch people play. It just drives us crazy. I can't imagine him just sitting there watching me. I mean, I don't know how many, what I made, but it was a nice, it was a really nice role and he made nothing off. Sure. It. Yeah, no, that, that it's so painful for those situations. I hate walking up to, t- to a table that's in the middle of a role. And typically I'll stand back from the table and look to see if the puck is on. And if it is, I'll just keep a good 10, 15 feet away from the table I want to play at. And then when I see, or if I either see the puck flip or if I hear the stick man say, you know, seven outline away, right. Then I'll quickly walk up to the table at that point. Because, yeah, there is nothing mentally more frustrating <laughs> than watching a good role that you're not a part of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. So, Josh, a couple things before we get uh, completely away from your trip. One, slots. So <laughs> we've, we've, we've made a big deal about it. I mean, what is it that's pushing you to play so much more slots? Because when we first started, when you and I got together and started meeting and stuff, mm-hmm. we played no slots. It was right. all craps. We would sit at a craps table for 12 hours a day. And usually when you're not there and I go by myself, That's what I do. I usually sit at a craps table for three, four hours at a time in a session, and I rarely play any slots. What is it that has now morphed you into somebody (laughs) that even when you're by yourself, you have a tendency just to gravitate to the slot machine and play much more limited craps? Right. It's a really good question, Chris. And even as we've talked about that, I've thought about it, and I don't know the answer exactly. I know that, as you said, when we first started playing, I mean, I played some slots. I played Heidi, as you guys know, but. I played yeah. for, you know, $2 and 70 cents a spin or even $6 and 30 cents a spin was a lot. And I think Chris started playing at $6 and 30 cents a spin and kind of that was like, okay, I like that. You know, that kind of yeah. thing. There's no question it's increased. Obviously it's, it's increased in amount per bet and it's included, it's increased in the amount of time I'm playing. So coin in through the machines and so on. I think I'm, I'm a little bit of an introvert sometimes on these trips. And when I'm particularly when I'm alone, I just want to be alone. So there is some appeal to just sitting in a slot machine and just doing my own thing. Craps is very social, even if it's just you and the dealers. And sometimes I don't feel like I want to be that engaging, even if it's just the dealers. I just want to sit there and have my coffee or whatever it is and be solitary. Which is such a weird dichotomy, though, because when we first started playing together and we talk about it a lot, you and I have a tendency to walk up to a solo table, an empty table. Right. And we prefer to play there. So you, you don't mind that situation. You like the social interaction. You'd rather be by yourself. And then you still end up at a slot machine most of the time <laughs> nowadays. So it's kind of, I don't know. It seems to be going, is it, is it the bonuses maybe is it, really what's probably pushing some, the larger numbers. There might be some pull the, some truth to that. The other thing that just runs counter to what we know to be true is that there's a part of my brain that thinks I can lose X dollars faster at a craps table than I will at a slot machine. So somehow there's, even though I know odds wise, that is over the course of time, that is incorrect. We're playing, you know, the odds, the house edge on the way we play craps is less than the house edge on my playing huff and even more puff. Sure. But in my head, I think I can take that just throwing out a number. I can take that $5,000 on a slot machine and do it for a longer period of time than the potential risk at a craps table. So sometimes in my head, when I'm thinking, I want to save money. There's part of me that says, just go play slots for a little bit. That ends up not happening, but I think that's part of what happens in my head. Do you think any part of it is that it's something that the casino prefers? So from a offer standpoint, a host standpoint, tier credits, all those things are much more advantageous as a slot player than a table games player. Yeah, I think that factors in too. I don't know what level that factors in, but it definitely is a, the idea that I'm going to get more free play or that kind of thing is, mm-hmm. is there for sure. I think about that. And it's a, it's a, a little bit of this comes with a word of caution. Like 
you know, I, I think I played more aggressively because I was a fair bit up on this sure. trip because I had had those hand pays at Venetian. So I knew I had more money to play with and I could kind of go, you know, as far as I wanted to within reason and not risk a losing trip or be close to not risking a losing trip, that kind of thing. So I had fun with that. So there was a little bit of it was that like, I might as well just do it. You know, I'm within my budget. I'm having fun, but there is definitely the drug of hitting the bonuses and that kind of thing for sure. Now, here's another question for you. You're somebody that I know typically plays $20, $25 a pull on a slot machine. You know, yes. there, (laughs) there have been times that I know that Josh plays $40, $50 a spin, whether he's on tilt or just really pressing it. But on the other side, if you're at a craps table, I never see you double your base bet on a craps table. Like for the most part, I would never see you go from 600 across to 1200 across, whether you're on tilt or just really free, you know, know, it's going well. So I'm going to double up and try 1200 across this time. Do you think there's a reason because of that? That's a really good question. And I, tr- I, I was pretty disciplined in slots this trip. I did go a few pulls at $60 a spin, but I tried to, okay. that didn't, didn't do anything for me. So I went back down. I do do it occasionally on craps, but it's happened kind of when you weren't there. Like I was thinking a couple of times I played crapless this trip. I think it was at Aria that I did go a hundred on all the numbers instead of our usual 50 okay. ish. So, gotcha. and, and you've seen me play increase the extremes to a hundred a few times. Yeah, occasionally. Sure. So yeah, yeah. it, but, I, but I'm more likely to do that. I think you're right is I'm more likely to do it slots. But again, I, as we're talking this through, I, those are things that I want to try not to do. This is the therapy session. I'm sure there are a lot of listeners there thinking about tax ramifications. Does that worry you at all? The amount of W2Gs that you're racking up? I mean, of course, as an itemized deductor, you're going to have losses to offset all these wins at the end of the year. So it shouldn't be that big of a deal. But does that factor in thinking that I'm now going to have to, at the end of the year, list out 75,000 different W2Gs (laughs) and all the information on them and make sure I have them all and it all matches up and all that stuff and maybe potentially raising my adjusted gross income or anything like that? It doesn't because I know I have the losses to, you know, to, to make it even at the end. The number as far as just being a pain to enter in my taxes factors in, just not wanting to have to do it. But I'm not worried about the overall end result tax ramifications. I'm comfortable with where I am and all that stuff. But yeah, just something to think about. I mean, I know there have been times that I've been a little concerned about W2Gs that were issued adjusting income levels for potential like tax credit phase outs and stuff. Right. Or I'm not really getting any income off this because there's losses that offset right. it, but it could phase you out of a deduction that you want to take. Yeah, I I think based on just my financial situation that I haven't found that that's happened yet. Not to say it couldn't, but. Okay, just, yeah, just something to throw out there for potential listeners that might be going down that path. But Josh, other than that, the only other thing I really wanted to ask about before we got off of this, like usual, I always like to finish it up by saying you spent your first couple days at Venetian. You spent your last couple days at Aria. Overall thoughts at the end of the trip, comparing the properties and where they seem to be sitting in your mind right now. That's a really good question. Right now, MGM and when Chris and I have talked about my offers have gone, we've gotten our latest offer since this last trip that I took to MGM and MGM loves me right now. Uh, I think they would probably give me, absolutely (laughs) give me most anything I wanted at the moment, but still, I think I really like the experience. I like the cruise that we had, well, that I had at MGM a lot, great cruise, but I think I like Choosing between the two right now, I think I would put Venetian just a smidge ahead, even though I think that the Sky Suites rooms are nicer. I just mm-hmm. like, I really like our host at Venetian. I've really liked the cruise that we had. I love the high limit room at Palazzo, both the video poker bar and the, the crapless craps table. I think I would put it just a little bit above. I think there's just more to do. Obviously, you've got all of the Venetian Grand Canal shops and that whole thing that Aria doesn't quite have. Yeah, shows and all sorts of different things that they offer that they don't. Yeah, no, I hear you. Okay. I was just curious where you fell on that topic, Josh, but uh, sounds like you had a great time. So after the break, we'll answer a couple listener questions and the big wheel will return. So stick around. Hey, podcast listeners, looking to elevate your next project? Dive into Fiverr, the ultimate marketplace for freelancers. Whether you need stunning graphics, top-notch audio editing, or just creative marketing help, Fiverr connects you with experts ready to bring your vision to life. With thousands of talented professionals at your fingertips, you'll find exactly what you need to make your next project shine. Ready to get started? 
Visit crapvegas.com slash Fiverr today. That's crapvegas.com slash F-I-V-E-R-R. Arr. Zork Fest 2024 is only a few weeks away. Josh, you're ready to go, I assume. I am absolutely ready to go. I understand there are still tickets available. It's going to be November 1st through 3rd at the Horseshoe Las Vegas. It is a travel and loyalty conference, and you can learn more about using points, about how to redeem points for amazing vacations, learn and understand more about casino comps. And what does your ZorkFest ticket include? It includes all ZorkFest educational sessions on Saturday, November 2nd, a stunning conference space with the high view, Friday night cocktail reception, which I think I'll be there, Saturday morning welcome coffee and a light breakfast reception, Saturday afternoon snack break, Saturday evening podcasters and influencers after dark, which I will definitely be at. And Chris, I understand there's going to be a pink drink available for people. In, oh, in my gonna honor, I'm going to say, I don't know what they're going to call it yet. We'll see if I get, okay. if I get billing on that. There's going to be Dice Labs and Blackjack Labs going on during Zorkfest itself. I'll be hosting some of the Dice Labs. Mark from You Can Bet on That will be hosting some of the Dice Labs. So it should be a lot of fun. Love to see anybody there that wants to join. Oh, good. Because I was going to say, when it comes to like bet payouts and stuff and teaching people to play, Mark is far more qualified than you are because just they could give you a random stack of chips and you'll be like, yeah, that's good. No problem. I was actually thinking about that too. <laughs> they want to get laminated payout sheets, you know, like they, like they have sometimes for blackjack and things like that. You need that. I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So if you want to get signed up, head on over to travelzork.com slash Zorkfest. That's travelzork.com slash Z-O-R-K-F-E-S-T. Okay, Josh, listener question time. We received a question over on the CV Facebook group and you didn't tell me who left it, so I can't include their name. But that being said, the question was, rookie question from someone that's played for a few years. Why does someone, and this is a craps question, why does someone choose to place bet the point instead of make a pass line bet? Appreciate the info. So he's wanting to know why some people will stay off the line, but then make a place bet on whatever the established point is. Right. Well, thank you, anonymous uh, commenter on the Facebook group, person that I forgot your name. I'm going to go with Noel. I'm going to call this person yeah, Noel. Noel's probably a good name for this person. Go ahead. So I would say there's a couple reasons that I can think of. And Chris, you should feel free to chime in too. The first one I can think of is you got there late. So you got to the table okay. or you made that bet after the point was established. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make the other way. So if you come up to a table or you get back from a bathroom trip or whatever it is that causes you to buy in or to make a bet when the point is established, don't make a, don't put that money on the pass line with odds. It is actually better at yeah. that point. Once the point is established to make a place bet. So that's one reason I can think of is that you're placing the point or straddling the pass line. If you want to think of it that way, because the point's already been established. The other reason Chris that comes to mind is you want to just decrease the variance of the, of the role. Yeah. What do you think? What are, what are some others? That's the big one in my mind. I think, I mean, the pass line is a good bet. Statistically, yes. house edge wise, it's a great bet to make. But just because it's a good statistical bet doesn't mean that it can't increase variance, which it does. Buying the four and 10 are pretty darn good bets at a craps table. Right. Buying the two and 12 are terrific bets, but they have ridiculously high variances associated with them. So for people that want to keep their variance down, maybe last at a table a little bit longer, just placing the point once it's been established, you'll have less variance because then you can pick and choose which points you prefer to play or if you'd mm -hmm. rather do something else, you can. If you put a pass line up bet out there and it comes out on a four or 10, the odds are far better of you hitting a seven than hitting that point. Right. So, I mean, there's reasons why people do want to avoid that. They always forget that it's a two-part bet though. The whole thing with the pass line bet is that it wins on a 7-Eleven on the come out and it loses on a 2-3-12. And too many people skip over that fact like it's not part of the bet right. when it's <laughs> right. a big part of the bet. In my purpose though, Josh, I use the pass line also as a hedge against my feature bets. Because if I'm playing the all-tall small and I have $50 on the all-tall small, if I skip the pass line just to place or buy right. the point number and a 7 comes on the come out roll, I just lost 50 bucks. Right. If I'm playing the pass line like I was going to do anyways, it's a push. So for me, it's a big hedge against feature bets, but I do understand why some people do it. 
one thing, Chris, as we're talking about this, that a story from Aria that kind of ties in with this same point that I forgot to mention. So there was a don't player at Aria, and you can explain why this is a bad thing. But the don't player was one of those players that you see that makes a don't pass bet. And mm-hmm. then if the point came out as a six or an eight, he would take down his don't pass bet, which is very stupid. So tell people why that's stupid. So the whole thing is on a don't pass bet, you're at the disadvantage on the come out roll. You are statistically, right. you're more likely to lose that bet than you are to win it. But once a point's been established, you have positive EV on that bet. Yes. It is far more likely that a seven is going to come well before any point that you establish. Even no if matter the point what is a six, six or an eight, eight, right? Six, eight, five, nine, four, ten. It does not matter. You have the advantage once the point is established. So you would be a fool to take it down. Even if you're afraid that a six or eight is going to come and you don't want to put odds, you're still better just to leave the base pass line or don't pass bet up there. Right. Because you have the advantage on it at that point. You do see people do that. I don't (laughs) understand why. A lot of people place pass line bets and then think they can take that down after the come out. (laughs) That would be fun. You can't do that because it's the opposite. You have the advantage on the come out and you're at the disadvantage afterwards. It's the opposite bet. So yeah, I would definitely not encourage anybody to put a don't pass bet and then take it down after a point is established. No, don't be that don't player. No, don't be a don't player. But in general, yeah, yeah. it's just a good rule. In general, (laughs) don't be a don't player. The odds are against you. (laughs) Yeah, May the odds be ever in your favor. (laughs) That's right. Josh, we received an email from Damien about high limit rooms. He had a couple different questions. He was hoping that we could answer and we're somebody that's played in a ton of high limit rooms. So I think we're good candidates for this. Sure. First question. Are most all high limit rooms the same? I would say absolutely not. They're very Agreed. different. Yeah. And some high limit rooms, most, most properties, especially the higher tier, higher end properties have a high limit slot room and then a high limit table games room of some sort. Some separate Baccarat. They have high limit Baccarat rooms. They mm-hmm. have all sorts of different, but that's one of the things that Like at Win, for example, the high limit slot room is very separate from the other high limit table games areas. At it is Venetian, is it at at Palazzo? Actually, they're they're very close. They're in the same space, or at least very close to each other. Right down a hallway, but yeah, they are kind of right near each other. And, And like Josh said, they're all different. Resorts World has a separate high limit baccarat room. Then they have another high limit space that has blackjack and roulette and a craps table that's never open. Right. And then their slot, their high limit slot area is actually kind of small and off to the side of that room. Yeah. And then Bellagio has Club Privé, which Mm -hmm. only has blackjack in it. That's high limit. But then they have another high limit Baccarat room. And of course they have a high limit slot room. They're all different. It just depends on the level of the property. The minimums change, the layout Mm -hmm. changes, the size changes. They're all different. Aria actually has, so Aria has the cave, their high limit Mm -hmm. slot cave. That's what I call it. Then they have another slot area, which has some table games. And then they have a high limit Mm -hmm. table games lounge right there by the entrance to Sky Suite that I think you've played some blackjack in before. I've hardly ever been in there, but so they have a few different spaces. Yeah, absolutely. So let's continue on with his questions though. And some of this stuff will overlap with that. His next question was, what are typical table minimums for craps and blackjack and high limit rooms? Well, you can speak to speak to blackjack. I really can't speak to blackjack much, but uh, I think it goes from $50 up. The cheapest that I've seen a craps table at a high limit room is $50. And that's the one that we saw at Palazzo. And I think I've seen it a few other places mm-hmm. at quite a few properties at when you're not going to find a $50 table in a high limit area for sure. It's going to be a hundred, no. 300, 500 and upwards. So, I mean, you're lucky if you can find a $50 table. I think at local properties, for sure. I know Chris has talked about it before. At local properties in their high labor rooms, you can easily find a 50 and probably less every once in a while. But what about blackjack, Chris? Blackjack, I mean, just it, it doesn't, uh, I mean, it varies by property. So if we're talking like Bellagio Aria level, you'll usually find a $100 blackjack table. But towards later in the day, it will jump to two or 300. And if you're talking double deck, Usually it's going to start around two or 300 period. There won't be a hundred dollar game in a high limit room. Yeah. $50 on craps is about the lowest you'll ever find it. Jump up to a place like when you're talking $500, right? They'll have hundred dollar blackjack on the main floor and hell they'll have it pay in six to five sometimes if you're not careful. <laughs> right. So yeah, you'll see that. I always tell people the best high limit room for blackjack in Vegas on the strip is going to be over at treasure Island. I've seen it at a quarter there. The worst you'll see it is 50. And they have the best blackjack rules on the strip. 
So if you want to play high limit blackjack in a high limit room on the strip, Treasure Island is the place to go. $50 game, six deck shoe game. That's terrific. Resplit aces, everything you could want. Surrender, all the good stuff. And they have a double deck game that you can double after split and everything for 50 bucks. Great game, good dealers. That's the place to be. And I will say on behalf of our listener, Boring Jack, High Limit Rooms are great places. High Limit Bars are great places to be, play a video poker, if that's your thing. Because yes, you can probably absolutely. play $1 machines. Yeah, $1 machines and get really nice drinks and play for a long time. And, and usually the service is better, the drinks are better, and you can still play if you're comfortable at that level without going too crazy. Yeah, and usually the pay tables are better too, Josh, on those dollar video poker machines than if you find it on the floor somewhere. Right. Next question. Are players rated the same in a high limit room versus the main casino floor? Well, I would say they should be, but I think I don't think they are. Right. I think they should be. (laughs) We, at least based on our experience, it's really just our experience, but high limit rooms oftentimes are going to have more seasoned, more experienced dealers and boxes and that kind of thing. And if you're tipping well, if you're nice and all that kind of stuff, oftentimes you're going to get more individual attention because there's going to be less players playing with you. So if they like you, they're going to probably rate you better. Yeah, I've always found my rating in high limit rooms is significantly better than on the main floor, whether it deserves to be or not, because I typically play the same way no matter where I'm playing. But I think Josh is right there at a typical high limit craps table. There's maybe one or two people. And at a typical high limit blackjack table, there's usually one. Right. You rarely see a crowded table in a high limit room. So you're typically getting a lot of attention. They're watching your bets closely. If you're taking care of the dealers, they want you to come back and play some more. Um, because high limit rooms just, they don't fill up. They just don't. Yeah. Typically in a high limit room, if there are six blackjack tables, there may be one, two players at most in the whole area. At a craps table, you're lucky to see somebody else. I mean, Josh and I have gone to Palazzo's High Limit Craps table. Have we ever played with another player there? Very rarely. I mean, every once in a while, maybe there'll be one. We had the guy on our last trip that was watching a lot. Almost every, every session yeah, we played. <laughs> he kept telling us he was learning the game, learning the game. And then he was walking over to a blackjack table and playing like $1,000 a hand. Right. But uh, no, he never actually played with us. Nice but, guy. Oh, super nice guy. It's just very rare to see a ton of players in a high limit room. Yeah, for sure. But your rating in theory would be the same, but in reality, it's probably not. It's probably better in high limit. Next question is casino credit required for play in a high limit room. Absolutely not. They will take anybody with money. Yeah, absolutely. They do not care. It's much easier if you're buying in for a large number to play in a high limit room. If you have credit, it does speed up the process a little bit, but no, you can, I've walked into high limit rooms many times and dropped $5,000 on the table and waited the 10 minutes for them to count it out. They don't care. They're just happy to have you. Yep, absolutely. One trick that I've learned, if you have a lot of cash that you were going to put in a slot machine, if it's $5,000, if it's $1,000, whatever, you can oftentimes go over to the high limit cage and they can give you a ticket for that cash more quickly mm-hmm. than it would be to feed those bills individually in. So completely oh, up yes. to you. But Yeah, they have machines back there that can speed up that process. Right. They typically will not give you chips for that cash, though. Right. Unlike at a poker room where you can go buy your chips before you walk up to the table, no cage that I've ever encountered would give you, say, a $5,000 chip for $5,000 in cash. They're just not going to do it. Right. Last question, Josh. Any other advantage or disadvantage to playing in a high limit room versus the floor other than less people at the tables? The only thing I could think of is just the you're probably going to get less people that just buy in and leave right away. You know, your $20 throwing it down on the table and leave kind of person, that oh, yeah. kind of thing. Just the, the, the atmosphere of the people is going to be a little bit different. I can't think of much else. I think atmosphere is the big thing I was going to say, but it really just depends on what your personality is. Because if you're somebody that likes a loud, boisterous area with tons of people and a lot of excitement, you're not going to like playing in a high limit room. That's true. Yeah. It's subdued. It's quiet. It's much more serious. I think I consider it more like what you would consider a European gambling experience. Yes. Where there's not yelling and screaming on the casino floor. It's more, let's dress up nice. Let's have very high quality drinks. Great service. But we're doing serious gambling here with a lot of money moving back and forth. So it's just a completely different demeanor of the people that are back there. And they take things more seriously because you're usually dealing with larger amounts of money. So if that entices you, it's a great place to play. And if you don't like that, I wouldn't step foot back there. 
Now, one thing going back to the slot talk, to the slot Vegas talk, Chris, that I see more often, I think, in high limit slot areas than on the main floor, you see people filming their slot sessions in high limit rooms. You do more often, which is weird to me when you see somebody with a with a gizmo hooked up to the machine with a oh, cell so phone weird. pointing at they have it. Two and- cell phone, yeah, one pointing at them, one pointing at the screen. It's really weird. It really is. I don't like it. I find it annoying. You did remind me of something else, though, Josh. If you are a slot player, slot service in high limit rooms is 10 times better than anything you will get on the main floor at every property I've ever been to. If you hit a hand pay in a high limit slot room, typically somebody will be there within three minutes. Yes. If you hit it on the main floor, it could be 20, 15, 20, and you don't see anybody. Right. And that is extremely consistent across the board. The other thing, too, is cocktail service, we should mention. Cocktail service is oftentimes better in the high living room. I wouldn't say always, but your chances of getting good service, I think, are better in high limit rooms than on the main floor. Yeah, absolutely. So great questions. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. Yeah, so thanks, Damien. Those are great questions. Okay, we received an email from Landry. He said, the Rate My Host feature of your website is a great idea, but I have an even better (laughs) idea. Can you provide details on how to switch hosts? <laughs> Once a host is assigned to you, it's like an STD. You <laughs> cannot get rid of it and no one wants to touch you. We have tried switching hosts a couple times and based on Vegas message boards, others have tried to. It usually goes like this after contacting a new host. The host says, oh, you're currently assigned to <laughs> STDA. Sorry, I can't help you. I say, but I did not want STDA. I want to get rid of STDA. And they say, sorry, you can't. Josh, this is a hundred percent true. And if I had a guide, I'd give it to you. I've tried to change host a hundred times and I've never been successful in it. And it usually goes almost identical to the way Landry described. Yeah. Thanks Landry. I think that's probably the most accurate thing anybody has ever said about changing hosts. And like, like Chris said, we have tried, I even remember having a host at Bellagio, not a host that I had at Bellagio, but I asked about how to change host because I wanted this other person. And, our, you know, our interests aligned. He was a former craps dealer, all that kind of stuff. I talked about him way early on in the show. And he said it's almost impossible. You'd have to write a letter to corporate and explain why and still might not happen, all this kind of stuff. And needless to say, I didn't do it. Most of the time, really, that's what's driven the changing of kind of dominant properties for me. I don't know about you, yeah, Chris, same. but it's it's not necessarily that I've had a bad host, although I have had bad hosts, but it's just that the host at property A hasn't been nearly as good as the host at property B. And Josh, I think you're hundred percent right. We have tried and I'll go a step further. Every time you try to change hosts, it almost always makes it worse because when you do, it inevitably gets <laughs> back to your original yes. host that you were trying to change. I'll email somebody and say, Hey, I'm dissatisfied with my current host. I would love for you to be able to work with me in the future and you won't hear anything. And then you'll, they'll forward your email to your host and he'll respond (laughs) back and be like, Hey, what did you need? Like, I know you're a problem. You don't like me. What do you want me to do? (laughs) It's terrible. So I think your best shots are change properties. Wait for that host to go to a different property. Wait for that host to get terminated or sub, right. Retire or something something like that. Right. But that's about it. Yeah, I think those are really your only options. I've never actually tried to go up the ladder, like the corporate ladder and be like, hey, this guy's not doing his job. Because Josh, at the end of the day, all these hosts are friends. Right. I mean, they all oh, talk yeah. to one another. You look at they their all, LinkedIn's and they're all connected to each I other. Mean, everybody, and God, it's not even just across a property. They're no. all friends with every other host in Vegas. It's yeah. a very tight knit community. So if you do go that route and reach out to corporate and say, hey, you know, Johnny is terrible as a host. I don't want him anymore. Please give me somebody else. Even if you do get assigned, that new host is going to talk to Johnny and be like, Hey, I got to sign this new guy that was mad at you. You know, what's going on. And I don't expect to get better service out of that second guy when he knows that you bailed on his friend. Right. It sucks. I'm sorry, Landry. I wish we had better info for you, but once you're assigned, you're stuck with them until they're gone for the most part. And it's not going to get better. Josh, last question of the week. We received a comment question from Johnny. Oh, I didn't mean to use Johnny's name in the last one when that wasn't, that was just a, uh, a placeholder name, but Johnny actually asked the question on CV Facebook group. Johnny asked, I think this may have been touched on in a previous episode, but I'm here to get a solid answer from all my crap Vegas friends. A friend of mine and I were playing craps at MGM Grand a couple months ago. Long story short, we are playing across, got paid on a number twice for the same role. 
They didn't catch it until after the next roll was thrown. Then they stopped play and asked us to give us chips back to them to make it right for their mistake. Question, are we legally obligated to give that money back to them? I told them, quote, we could give it back, but isn't this the cruise problem and they already paid me? What if we don't give it back? They said something along the lines they were legally allowed to kick us out of the casino for not doing so. Although it wasn't a lot of money, they said they would get it back one way or another, especially if it was anything substantial. They also rambled on about morals and ethics. So I saw it as keep the money and be kicked out or just give it back and move on from this and keep playing. Please help this beautifully maturing craps amateur, Johnny. (laughs) Great question, Johnny. And thanks for posting it on the Facebook group. I think, and I don't know the legal answer, but my understanding is that if there is a mistake made that results in your overpayment, that is the casino's money. That is not your money. And they can ask for it back. Now, if you fought that, then, you know, it would have to go to approving that the mistake was made and all that kind of stuff. But they could definitely kick you out. That's probably what they would do. Yeah, I think this all comes down to, is it worth fighting for in this case? Because if you refuse to pay, they will trespass you. Yeah, They will kick you off their property. And if this is like an MGM property or a Caesars property, they'll ban you from all their properties. Right. They will. They have no hesitation. They can ban you anytime they want to for any reason. Legally, do they have the right to get those chips back? Probably. I think they do. I think it's similar. uh, You know, an analogy is the malfunction voids all bonuses on a slot machine. It's the same idea. It's a mistake causing a mispayment that voids that voids that instance. I think it's a kind of a similar thing. And to be fair, on the other side of that, if you're underpaid for any reason, you have the right to get that money from them. Yeah. If they short paid you and for whatever reason, two rolls later, you realize you were short paid then yeah, you can push back on them and make them go check the tape and they will. And if they notice they short pay you, they'll fix it. Yep. So I do think you should pay it back morally. Yes. Ethically. Yes. And probably legally. It's just really how much do you want to fight with them? Cause that's not a fight I'm going to make. And typically in my position, I'll take the extra money. If they ask for it back, I'll give it to them. Right. But Josh knows from playing with me, most of the time they pay me wrong. If they overpay me, I typically throw it back to them anyways. Even on stupid stuff like VIGs, there's a lot of times the VIG on a $150 bet will be $7 and I'll throw them $10 and they'll throw me five bucks back because they weren't paying attention or something. And I'll be like, oh no, I owe you two bucks or, you know, whatever it may be. I'll do that because I just don't want to take money that I'm not due. But yeah, I mean, you better be willing to get trespassed from a property to keep it. So, I mean, that's on you at that point. See, part of the benefit that I have of being ignorant about payouts is I can then oftentimes fake ignorance about payouts. Like I'm you pretty sure they pay me wrong, but you know, I depend on Chris for these things. So I, I do that a lot, Josh. There's plenty of times that I've noticed I've been overpaid at a table and I'll just pick it up and immediately stick it in my rack with all my other chips mixed, right. in, mixed in. And then if they say something a minute later, I'll be like, oh, I wasn't even paying attention. I'm sorry. I was just watching the roll. Exactly. And, I mean, I know I got overpaid, but hey, you know, it's not my job. It's your job. Sometimes I honestly don't know. I just suspect. Yeah, that feels like like too much. (laughs) Okay, Josh. So with that said, let's keep it rolling. Patreon, patreon.com slash crap Vegas. Josh, what's new over there? Well, we have two new things over there. First of all, we have our last episode of Fading Crap Vegas, our wonderful show where Chris and I are running it all through the college and NFL football seasons. He's selecting five college games. We're picking against the spread on those. And I'm selecting five NFL games. We're picking against the spread on those. This is all for just entertainment purposes. And if you're particularly, if you're following my picks, you're better off fading us than, uh, than you are following. And we've also got our, our, uh, let's see, episode five of our CV TV CC Casino Confidential CVTV, where we're watching the show Casino Confidential, and Chris and I are commenting on it as we're watching together, and that was a lot of fun. This one was Cattle Call, I think, episode five of Casino Confidential. It was. There was some. Uh, there were some people on that, Josh. That uh, they were lookers. I'll just say that. I'm not going to say positive <laughs> or negative, but they were lookers. So we're having a lot of fun over on Patreon. We're trying to do some kind of neat stuff, and we're actually going to record a Patreon episode right after this show. And we're excited about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So a big thank you to those that signed up the past couple of weeks. That's Jason, Ed A with an annual subscription. Thank you, Ed. Michael S, Tony A with an annual subscription. Tim B, Jamie M with an annual subscription. And Louis K. So thank you guys all for signing up. And Josh is right. 
Nowadays, with all the content that we're doing now, you're getting six bonus episodes a month. That's a lot for, you know, starting (laughs) off at $7 a month. It's not that much money. You're getting six bonus episodes. We'd love to have you over there. And I think Josh and I are really enjoying recording all this extra stuff on the side. It's a lot of fun. Um, So I think it, I think it kind of shows in the recording as well. So I think you'd be uh, well-versed to get over there and get signed up. So thanks for your support. Thanks to our new patrons, especially the ones that signed up for our annual, annual subscriptions, but we appreciate everybody. So thank you all. Yeah, absolutely. Upcoming trips, Josh, I'm going to be out there maybe, maybe, maybe September 18th and 19th. It's the day after my birthday. Oh, so it's theoretically right now it's open. I'm thinking about going out. That being said, I don't know where I got to talk to Josh more and see if uh, he wants to come to and then try to make a decision. I'm leaning towards when because I haven't been there in a while. They give you birthday free credit and stuff. And there's a lot of things I'd, I'd like to go back and do there. So that's the direction I'm leaning right now, but not 100% sold yet. And it's possible, I would say 50-50 at this point that I could join Chris, but I'd like to because we're going to miss our next kind of usual trip because I'll be in town for Zorkfest and he can't make it that weekend. So I want to try and make it for this September trip. I haven't been, I haven't stayed at Wynn this year. I looked, that I have crazy. no Wynn tier credits. So goodbye, Wynn Black. Wow. Unless I play huh. lot of slots and make it in one weekend. I was going to say, you'll probably <laughs> hit black if you come with me knowing your slot play now. So no worries there. Our host at Wynn is going to be like, what happened to him? What? Yeah, you changed he changed since he last time he turned over a here. new leaf, right? And Josh, I will mention on here, nothing is set in stone on this one. I'm very faintly throwing around the idea of going to Vegas for F1 this year. Now that nobody else is going, it won't be as crowded. We have race tickets. We have great rooms lined up for it. I'm considering it. Yeah, that would, I would say it's probably going to be one or the other for me, most likely. I don't know if I could do the the September trip and F1 with Zorkfest in there, but I'm intrigued about the F1 idea too. Might be fun for us to do. Well, we'll have to talk about that, Josh, because if you're going to pick between the two, I'd much rather if we were into F1 together, because with the tickets and everything, I think it'd be more fun seeing it together. Right. Friendly reminders, subscribe and leave a review on your favorite podcasting app and to visit our merch store. That's crapvegas.com slash shop. Our sale is now over, Josh, but I've introduced a new benefit for our patrons. All patrons now get 15% off all merch shop purchases going forward. That's fantastic. Yeah. So if you need something, that's a good way to save some money. You might be able to save more money on the merch just by signing up. So we'd love to have you. Okay, Josh, we've made it to the very end. It feels like it's time for the big wheel. So why don't we give it a roll? Let's give it a spin. It's time to spin the crap Vegas big wheel. Are you ready? Josh, spin the wheel. Oh, Chris, this one has a special introduction. It wasn't us. It wasn't us? It wasn't us. So any idea what flying money and human head have to do with Vegas and gambling? Anything anything ringing any bells yet? No, I'm completely in the dark on this one. All right. So just recently, within the last day or so, Wynn Resorts agreed to pay $130 million to federal authorities and admit that it let unlicensed money transfer businesses around the world funnel funds to gamblers at its flagship Las Vegas property. Do you know about this story? No, I haven't heard this at all. That's very interesting. Yeah, the company said the forfeiture wasn't a fine, and its findings in a decade-long case didn't amount to money laundering. But US, the U.S. attorney in San Diego said the settlement showed that casinos are accountable if they let foreign customers evade U.S. law. She said the $130 million was believed to be the largest forfeiture by a casino based on admissions of criminal wrongdoing. Wynn hmm. said that it severed ties with all people and businesses involved in what it characterized as convoluted transactions overseas. <laughs> That's what I would call it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds much better. The federal government, on, on the other hand, t- dubbed it as flying money involved involving unlicensed money agents using multiple foreign bank accounts to transfer money to the casino for use by a patron who couldn't otherwise access the cash in the United States. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a good thing. And here's the human head part. Another involved having a person referred to as a human head gamble at the casino at the direction of another person who was unwilling or unable to place bets because of anti-money laundering laws. 
Wow. This feels a lot more illegal than Wynn's making out to be, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was, you know, of course it's Wynn, so it hit right on the right on the head with us, but I thought that was really interesting. Well, it also reminds me of the story that just broke this past week, Josh, about the uh, guy out in California, the money launderer that got arrested by the feds. I this don't one I don't know name. about. Yeah, you do. He's the guy that was the big craps player that was all over Reddit, that was playing millions of dollars at a time. Oh, he was, yeah. This all happened at Resorts World, and they well, got in big yeah, trouble that one, over yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Because they were allowing him to play money that they knew was laundered and right, all this other right. stuff oh, on yeah, the yeah. side. Yeah, that was a big story. I wish I had more details on it. We talk about it, but maybe on the wheel next time. It's almost like there's nefarious characters involved in gambling in Vegas. It, it's crazy. Yeah. Why, <laughs> Who would you think? Know, I always, I always wondered why they took so many steps, you know, that are against anti-money laundering there, you know, but uh, it's starting to come together now. All right. Let's see what's next on the wheel. All right, Chris, they don't call them the Cincinnati Bungles for nothing. A no, day, they don't. A day after Circa set a record for prize money, $14.2 million and over yep. 14,000 entrants in its $1,000 per entry survivor contest. Almost 40% of the field was eliminated the first week of NFL Sunday because the Bengals were the most popular pick in people's survivor pools and players yes. lost a total of $5 million in that contest when the Bengals lost to the Patriots 16 to 10. Yeah. As somebody that used the Bengals in my survival <laughs> That's pool, why I, mentioned I was not very happy about it. The Bengals were supposed to be really good this year. The Patriots were supposed to be the worst team in pro football this year. And they somehow lost at home, and I was not happy about it at all. No, I wasn't either. The funny thing was, 45 people paid $1,000 into the circuit contest and then forgot to make a pick. Oh, that doesn't surprise <laughs> that me would at be all. Me. As somebody That's... that runs a survival contest every year for, through our Patreon, <laughs> I see it every time and have to beat people up to get their picks in. So, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. So that's a short wheel today, but that's the, that's the end of the wheel. Okay. Josh, anything else before we go? So I have two things, Chris. One is something that just happened today, and it's a, I was trying to figure out how, if we should talk about it on the show and how it connected to Vegas, but we just found out before we recorded that James Earl Jones passed away. And James Earl Jones is a, you know, a neat actor to a lot of people, and his voice is well-known, obviously, from Star Wars. Chris, do you know where I'm getting the Vegas connection here? I do no, Come I mean, to I know the he dark was Darth Vader. Side. Come to the dark oh, side. <laughs> I gonna, well, I was close. I knew, I you knew were what right you there, were right? kind of hangling at, but I didn't get it. Yeah. So anyway, just wanted to say rest in peace to, to uh, James Earl Jones. Don't come to the dark side. We won't play craps with you if you do. But Absolutely. Uh, rest in peace, James Earl Jones. The last thing on a much lighter note is, Chris, did you follow the story of the eagle in Missouri? Does this mean anything no. to you? Okay, so. This, I'm missing out on so many pop culture things today. You are. This is this might be the funniest story that that I've seen in a long time. So a bald eagle in Missouri, they thought it was injured because it couldn't fly. So rescuers were called and they they went to see why this bald eagle couldn't fly and they x-rayed it and it turned out it just ate too much. And so they they it had a raccoon in it. Been there, done that before, <laughs> it yeah. It couldn't fly because it was too fat. Well, I mean, and we say people are in food comas. So, I mean, so what's the difference? <laughs> the eagle had a big raccoon inside it and couldn't fly. Somehow they rehabilitated the eagle and then it was released into the, into the wild. They did a colon cleanse and he was good to go. <laughs> Apparently. I just love that story. The fat that eagle. That is pretty funny. Very strong Vegas tie there. It makes complete sense why you'd bring it up on here. I didn't. It wasn't in the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Josh. It's been a lot of fun. So uh, thank you all for listening and we will do it again next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Vegas, here we come. Thanks for listening to the Crap Vegas podcast. Have you ever been to Vegas? Check out all our recent news and our Vegas trip calendar by visiting crapvegas.com. See you in Vegas. I am Chris. He's Josh. Josh. Josh, who Josh, Jots. Josh, do you, what's your name? What's your name? I forgot it already. Crap <laughs> Vegas. No, that's yeah. the show. I'm Vegas Duffy. Oh, good. I think I, I think I remembered it now. I got it down. I wrote it down in pencil in front of me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first of all, Noel, thanks for the, thanks for the questions. And nope, stop. It's not Noel. I mean, this is Nicole. a Christmas, Josh. It's Nicole. <laughs> Damn it. I was close. <laughs> Noel. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Kringle, for your message. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Hold on.
Thanks, Noel, for the questions. No, uh, still not Noel. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't last time. It's not this time. <laughs> Alzheimer's is kicking in early with you. Thanks, Noel, for the... <laughs> nope. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much for the question, Nicole. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> Four times a charm. <laughs> I got nowhere to be. You're good. Nicole? Still Nicole. No cage that I've ever encompassed. En- encompassed. <laughs> uh, Noel. Yeah, Noel. If you only knew the power of the dark side. <laughs>